Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our sixth Neurotech X webinar. My name is Sydney Swain Simon, and I'm one of the co-founders of Neurotech X. If this is your first time hearing about our organization, uh, we are an international community that facilitates the advancement of neurotechnology. We have a focus on open and accessible neurotechnology, and our community has helped to innovate in the domain through a variety of different projects. We have had contact points with 11,000 people worldwide and have done collectively over 150 events. We also have local chapters worldwide where you can get yourself connected if you want to. Because we have such a large international network, the goal of these webinars is to give people from different countries and different disciplines the chance to learn about different neurotechnology subjects. We'll be doing these webinars on different themes such as VR and EEG, as well as showcase some of the amazing projects and research that our community does. We are always looking for feedback to improve the webinars, so please let us know how we can do a better job. With that in mind, there are two things you should know uh, for this webinar. Uh, number one, please be respectful to those in chat. And number two, if you do have any questions, please post them in chat. I'll be monitoring as we go throughout this uh, event. Final thing before we get started is that if you are interested in hosting your own Neurotech X webinar, uh, please send me a message on Slack, or you could always email me at sydney at neurotechx.com. With that, let's jump into our webinar. For this session, we have Steve M. Potter, who will be presenting closed loop optical and electrical neural interfacing. This webinar will introduce you to the future of neural interfacing, closed loop optical interfaces. Uh, he will explain optogenetics and how uh, it can be used to control neural activity with more specificity and precision than electrical interfaces can. In his lab at Georgia Tech, he developed a number of open source solutions for neural interfaces, including uh, MeBench, NeuroWriter, and most recently, OptoClamp. He pioneered closed loop interfaces to study learning and memory in cortical networks grown in vitro. Some of these compromised hybrid system, uh, comprised hybrid systems in which living neurons were embodied in robots or simulated animals. By using closed loop feedback, network dynamics, learning, and neural plasticity can be studied at a variety of time scales, both in vitro and in vivo. He used closed loop optical and electrical neural interfaces to control seizure activity and study homeostatic plasticity associated with epilepsy, chronic pain, uh, tinnitus, and other DF differentiation syndromes. If you have not heard of Professor Potter before, uh, he and his research group spent the past two decades developing new ways to study neural dynamics and plasticity at the networks level using cortical networks of neurons and glia growing in petri dishes uh, instrumented with arrays of electrodes. They created the field of embodied culture networks, a new hybrid lab animal whose brain sits on the microscope stage while its robotic body behaves. Potter is semi-retired adjunct associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology and Emory University School of Medicine. From 1993 to 2002, he worked as a research faculty at Caltech in the labs of Professor Scott Fraser and Professor Jerry Pine, uh, building two photon microscopes, uh, a high-speed neural activity imaging camera, and closed-loop multi-electrode array neural uh, culture systems. He is currently a freelance consultant, writer, teacher, and maker in Dundalk, Ireland. And uh, all of his research can be found, uh, and his publications can be found on his website at potterlab.gatech.edu. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you, uh, Professor for Potter, for joining us. Uh, please go ahead. OK, thank you very much, Sydney, for that introduction. And thanks especially for your work in getting Neurotech X off the ground and making this a very useful forum for neurohackers to meet with academics and for us to advance the ideas of uh, interfacing with the brain and hopefully improving people in various different ways. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, and I think as you mentioned in the chat, um, if you have a question, I think Sydney will hold them to the end, but I'm happy to be interrupted if he wants to, but put the word in big caps uh, question at the beginning of your question and, and that way he can see them easily. I'm now gonna go to my um, slideshow and to do that I have to click the little screen share button. Great, so you should be seeing my desktop and
Okay, maybe Cindy, you could type me a confirmation that this is all coming through in the little uh, dialog window. Uh, yeah, you're perfectly fine. Great, okay. Because I'm not getting any feedback when I do full screen. Okay, here I go. So, um, you heard most of this in the introduction. And, oh, the little slight advancer button is not working. Why is that? There we go. There's my abstract. Okay, I wanted to say that I feel like we're at the stage with neural engineering, or neuroengineering as I prefer, uh, that Jules Verne was with space travel around 1865. In his story there, uh, the astronauts were shot out of a very large bullet with a big cannon up to the moon. About a, it took about 100 years to develop the Saturn V rocket that actually brought people to the moon. And I'm a little bit sad to say not much has advanced in the 50 years in between. The Merlin engines that SpaceX is using now are pretty much the same as the ones that they used on the Saturn V rocket. Um, one thing that's different is a lot more feedback systems that they're using um, that make these things get their targets when they're landing and whatnot. Okay, now hold on a sec. For some reason, my slide advancer is not advancing. You use the click. Ah, I guess I have to click to advance. Okay. So let's think about deep brain stimulators. These are implanted in patients with Parkinson's disease to relieve their tremors and get them moving again. Deep in their thalamus, they're receiving high frequency stimulation all the time. This is open loop stimulation. So what's missing is the feedback. There's no recording going on here. There's no adjustment of the stimulation according to what's happening in the person's physiology or their neurophysiology. And however, if you look at every other engineered system out there, whether it's a factory or a stereo, uh, there's feedback. There's some kind of uh, set point that you want things to be at, and there's a measurement from the system. The system, in our case, might be the brain. And you are looking at the difference between those. That's the error signal. You do some processing of that and you do some change that affects the system and hopefully gets it to the state you want it to be in. You know, in the case of a transistor radio, you have a certain feedback amplifier that's going to adjust the volume and make it uh, nice and linear. Uh, Professor Potter, sorry yep. to interrupt. If you could just click uh, the hide button uh, on the uh, screen sharing notification. Oh, there we go. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, screen share. Oh, that made me stop screen sharing, though. That's a problem. No, you're still screen sharing. You're, you just have to go to your presentation. Ah, OK, cool. Get used to this. All right, so not only uh, an engineered system. No, you're not screen sharing anymore. <laughs> oh, you're not screen Is it all right? Uh, so now I just see your, your video feed. Interesting, because I, all right. Let's back to that. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Screen share. Share screen. There we go. Right. And we will hide this hopefully without stopping the screen sharing. Back to that slide. All right, so not only in engineered systems do we have a lot of feedback, but also in biological systems as well. Here's my little engineering drawing of the brain. You've got the world being perceived by the perceptual system. You've got some goals to do something in the world, and you've got some motor circuits controlling your movements, and your perceptual system notices how well your last movement happened and compares it to your goal. Are you accomplishing what you tried to? And circuits like the cerebellum are adjusting your motor circuits in order to make it work better next time. So there's lots of feedback in all control systems, uh, not so much in neuroengineering yet, but we're trying to change that. So I and uh, my co-editors, Ahmed Ohadi and Ever Everhard Fetz, put together a book of articles, 32 articles by 151 other authors it's all about closed loop neuroscience to try to put this subject on the map and open it up for discussion. This is uh, free for the downloading at Frontiers. If you go to frontiersin.org, 
you can get a copy of this book and learn more than you wanted to know about what people are doing today in the research world with closed loop neuroscience. If the whole concept of closed loop neuroscience doesn't mean anything to you yet, that's perfectly all right. I'll talk a little bit more about it during this talk. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll walk away saying, oh yeah, why aren't we all doing this? So this slide sort of summarizes the activities that were going on in my lab for the last couple of decades. We are uh, mostly an in vitro research lab. And by in vitro, I mean we grow cortical neurons from rats in a Petri dish that's instrumented with electrodes. And um, let's see, I can, I might be able to show, show you one of those. Okay, Is my video back here. Yeah, so here is what these multi-electrode arrays look like. There are 60 electrodes in that dish, and you can see that it's got a little chamber there that would be filled with cell culture medium, and about 100,000 neurons from the rat brains um, that we got them from. So that device is sitting there on a microscope stage where we can image it in great detail and we can record its activity and we can take those recordings and process them in real time with our electronics and, and software and use them to control either robots in the lab or simulated animals called neurally controlled animats. An animat is a, uh, any kind of simulated animal and our lab was the first to actually control simulated animals with real live living neurons. You can also take the sensory system of the robots and use that to stimulate the culture dish. So you can create this closed loop sensory motor system. Basically you have a semi-living creature where its brain is sitting on the microscope where it can be studied and its body is somewhere else, either on the lab floor or simulated on a computer. You can also model this network with a, a complete simulation in as much detail as you want on a computer and do simultaneous microscopy, time-lapse imaging or electrophysiology imaging. Sorry about this tag here. Okay. So these uh, Multi-electrode array stimulation systems were first built by my first graduate student, Daniel Vaucanar, and my first postdoc, Tom DeMars, at Caltech. They can provide complex multi-electrode stimuli that could be used as artificial sensory input, could be used to modulate the network's activity, or even as a training signal. So for example, my graduate student, Zainas Chow and Doug Bauckham, came up with an algorithm for training cultured networks to move in a certain direction. So this was a task where they were asked to move, say, in the direction of this black arc. And if they moved in the right direction, we stimulated with a certain pattern. And if they moved in the wrong direction, we stimulated with them a different pattern. And here you can see that after a while, on the order of maybe 20 or 30 minutes, they learned to move in the right direction. So here's a learning curve showing successful learning but that only happened if it was closed loop. If the stimulation was contingent on what the animat was doing at any given moment. If we take the recording from the previous day's experiment, a closed loop experiment that was successful, and we just play it back to another culture or to even to the same culture, we don't get any more learning. So it has to be closed loop. If you just have stimulation that isn't contingent on what the animal is doing, then it doesn't work. It doesn't train the network. This complicated slide explains how that algorithm worked for stimulating and training these cultures. Uh, I won't explain it. I'll just refer you to our paper from 2008. And I'll post all of these slides up on my website after this. So you don't even have to take notes from the slides if you don't want to, uh, if you want to follow up on these papers. And as, I, as we mentioned before, all of our papers are downloadable from my uh, publications page on our website. Okay, so what else we did besides the neurally controlled animats was to, um, to study the idea of quieting bursts of activity with electrical stimulation. These cultures 
sort of produced activity that looked a lot like seizures because they were cut off from the sensory world most of the time. And here is a graph that shows these spikes representing a, a dish-wide burst where every electrode in the dish is picking up signals, uh, synchronous signals. And if you then turn on a stimulation with one electrode, you can quiet those down, but only to a certain point. You can't quite get rid of all those bursts of activity. If you use a multi-electrode array, you can quiet them down completely, and that's what's shown here. Now, that doesn't mean that the network is not firing. It's still firing, but they're not synchronized anymore. Then if you use a closed loop system, so not just multi-electrode, but actually closing the loop, where you're setting the activity to a certain set point here, like 400 spikes per uh, MEA, or if you divide that by 60, you know, it's a few tens of spikes per electrode per second, you can completely get rid of all the bursts. So these black dots here are bursts of activity where the dish is synchronized. And as we turn up the set point in a closed loop system, we can completely quiet down this seizure-like activity. And my graduate students, John Ralston and Sharanya Desai worked in the lab of Robert Gross to translate this idea to rats. And it was so successful that Sharanya is now working at Neuropace where she's hoping to uh, develop systems for closed loop stimulation that will be implanted into people, that are being implanted into people by Neuropace. So by closing the loop, we were able to do this quieting with far fewer electrodes or using lower voltage than if we use an open loop approach. So this is just another graph depicting uh, successful closed loop stimulation on multi-electrode arrays. If you turn on the stimulation, you can keep that firing at a very good set point. If you then lock the stimulation at a certain value that was working, uh, it still stays at a pretty good average firing rate, but the variance goes way up which means that the firing rate is fluctuating a lot because you're not adjusting it according to what's going on in the dish anymore. And then, of course, when you turn off the stimulation, it, it changes to something else entirely. So closed-loop stimulation was very effective at controlling activity levels in these culture dishes and at reducing seizures in rats. So on to optogenetics. Optogenetics uh, is a technique that's been around for about a decade now. And the idea was to take some genes from algae and bacteria that make those creatures light sensitive and put them into neurons to make them light sensitive. And the heroes of this story are Carl Dyseroth and Ed Boyden, who did this for many different constructs. And the thing that they did that was most amazing was to share these constructs with anybody who wanted to use them. So our lab used them and hundreds of other labs received their constructs for free to do research and to make this field really take off. So there are um, certain constructs that are ion channels. There are other ones that are ion pumps and um, they do various things to the neurons, either inhibiting them or exciting them. And that means that you can do pretty much anything that deep brain stimulation can do or might be able to do in the future, such as neuromodulation. You can imagine adjusting the state of hunger, um, preventing you from eating too much by just stimulating the part of your brain that controls satiety. You could imagine some uh, sensory prostheses that would allow blind people to see, for example, by stimulating their visual cortex directly with light. Uh, or you could imagine a sensory motor prosthesis in which artificial limbs have sensory system built into them that allows the person to also feel with their skin or know what position their arm is in. There's some very tricky things you can do like transsynaptic labeling using rabies virus uh, with the optogenetics and um, it's very handy for basic research into neural coding. So optogenetic tools are particularly well suited for use in feedback neural control with multi-electrode arrays because they have very minimal electrical recording artifact. The artifact is a big problem with electrical stimulation. The kinds of signals we record are about 1,000 or maybe even 10,000 times smaller than the kinds of stimuli that we deliver. So getting rid of those stimulation artifacts is always a problem with electrical stimulation. If you use optical stimulation, you don't have to worry about that. 
They have a relatively narrow excitation spectrum, which means that you could use blue light, for example, to excite uh, one kind of construct and yellow light to activate another construct. You could do bidirectional actuation. You could have one construct excite and one inhibit. You can use various genetic constructs with different promoters to make these things expressed only in certain cell types. So you could have them expressed only in pyramidal neurons, for example, or only in inhibitory neurons. They have very good temporal resolution on the order of a millisecond. And with more genetic engineering, they're only going to get better and better. You could co-express them with fluorescent proteins so that you can see which cells are labeled, which ones are expressing the constructs. You can create a reversible lesion. You know, you could, you could have a circuit that gets turned off by shining light on it. And in a sense, that's a lesion that when you turn the light off, uh, goes away and the brain is back to normal again. And uh, one detail is that there's a, a chemical that's required for these to work in some of the constructs and mammals have that thankfully in their physiology. Uh, if, you, if you're working with optogenetics, you spend a lot of time worrying about the packaging and the delivery of the, of the gene to get it into the neurons. Usually we use lentivirus. Uh, it has a fairly larger um, package size than this one called adeno-associated virus. Uh, this has other advance, advantages to do with the tropism of what kinds of cells it tends to infect. Um, some of these other details here are really only uh, appreciated by people who get into the business of, of packaging it and uh, making sure that it's efficient at expressing, you know, using mammalian codons. If you use a rabies virus, you can actually send it all the way from the sensory system up into the sensory central nervous system across synapses. It's been expressed in a wide variety of different creatures. Um, pretty much all the way up from worms to, to mammals, even primates. I'm not sure if it's been done in humans yet, but I have no reason to believe it wouldn't work just fine in humans. And in terms of delivering the light, fiber optics are much more biocompatible than wires. They, they, uh, they're just made of glass and they survive implantation much better and longer than wires do and they don't get rejected by the tissue as much. So what did we do with optogenetics? We built a closed loop system, of course. Uh, and when I say we, I mean mostly John Newman, my former graduate student who built this thing called the OptoClamp, which allows you to control the activity of one of these culture dishes with light using uh, two different constructs. One, that if you shine blue light on it, you excite the neurons, and if you shine yellow light on it, you inhibit them. And we used the promoter from Chemkinase 2 Alpha, which means that it's expressed only in excitatory neurons. So we were able to turn the excitatory neurons off and on with this closed loop system. So little um, engineering diagram, we got some set point that we want as experimenters. We uh, have a dish of neurons here, we shine light on it, and if it doesn't come to the right set point, we adjust our light device to send in a different amount of either blue or yellow light to get the right um, set point there. And I should mention that all of this is done using our open source uh, electrophysiology setup called NeuroWriter. You can go to this website and download all of the code and the plans for the circuit boards and um, build it yourself for only a few thousand dollars. Oops, I know that sounds a bit expensive, but compared to the off the shelf stuff that we bought originally, that was on the order of $100,000. We're talking about a factor of 10 uh, cheaper. John Newman is very much involved with this movement called Open e -Phys to make a lot of very inexpensive tools for electrophysiology available to neurohackers and amateurs or even professionals that are also being used in academia quite a bit. And a lot of the devices that he has built are up there uh, with the plans for uh, building them yourself. Um, you could, I think you can also buy some of them that are already pre-built. And he's also involved with establishing standards for multi-unit electrophysiology so that doing closed-loop experiments will become easier and easier. So go to open-ephys.org to learn more about that. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, we could clamp the activity at different levels. Um, this is using sort of a, a proportional integral controller system. 
And here's an example where our set point is the red line and the black line inside of it is the measured activity level. So it's actually so good, so well clamped that it's inside the set point line there. The blue and yellow lines are the light that we're delivering to clamp it at a certain level. And this uh, raster gram shows the activity of all the neurons in the dish spiking away there being controlled to various different set points over time. This can be done across hours. Here's a whole bunch of 12 hour long experiments where the activity was set to certain set points. And you can see that we uh, reached our target in a perfectly linear fashion multiple days in a row for 12 hours for a given culture. One thing that's interesting to note is that the light that it took to do that varies quite a bit. So this zigzaggy line here shows that to get such a nice clamping of the firing rate with light, you have to deliver different amounts of light on different days depending on the state of the culture. So it's a growing living thing and it's changing all the time. And that's one of the reasons why closing the loop is so important. You have to adjust for that. So we also studied homeostatic plasticity, which is a form of slow learning or adaptation. Circuits in the brain and, and the whole nervous system, in fact, tend towards a preferred level of activity. And if you perturb them in some way, for example, by um, cutting off inputs, compensatory mechanisms kick in and they try to bring the activity back to normal. That's called homeostasis. However, these homeostatic mechanisms can be harmful and they're responsible for causing epilepsy after head injury, for causing chronic pain after a limb gets amputated, and for example, causing ringing in the ears or tinnitus when somebody goes deaf or, or starts to lose their hearing. So my former grad student, Ming-Fei Fong, worked with John Newman and this um, optoclamp system to study this idea of homeostasis, where if you stimulate the cells quite a bit and then turn off the stimulation, their activity level rises tremendously because they, um, no, I think I said that wrong. You're, you're, in hit, you're reducing their stimulation. Uh, they start to become hypersensitive. And when you turn off that reduced stimulation, so now they can behave normally again, they have a homeostatic response that shows um, that their activity is increased. That's called synaptic scaling. And the mechanisms of synaptic scaling were not really known. And Ming-Fei Fong really uncovered the fact that um, it was neurotransmitter blockade uh, that showed us that it was neurotransmitter signaling and not spiking as the trigger for the scaling. So we could control the spiking and the neurotransmitter signaling independently using the optoclamp and using neurotransmitter blockers at the same time. And this allowed us to disentangle those variables. So we were so successful with that in vitro that we did an in vivo experiment in collaboration with Garrett Stanley's lab. So Clarissa Whitmire and Daniel, Daniel Millard uh, had some rats. We implanted fiber optics into their thalamus and we were able to send light signals into their uh, somatosensory thalamus, the part of the thalamus that processes the signals from their whiskers. And for rats, whisker information is very important for navigating in the dark. And um, they could basically send in activity that would uh, act as false sensory information. So the rat would perceive that it was touched with something on its whiskers when it was just getting flashes of light in the middle of its thalamus. You could use this to counteract anesthesia with light, for example, and do some experiments on anesthetized animals that you normally couldn't do. So closed loop tools like the NeuroWriter and OptoClamp enable neuroscientists to study neural systems with exquisite control. We answered a long standing question about synaptic scaling that neurotransmitter release matters more than spiking itself. Closed loop optical neural control also works well in vivo as we showed in Garrett Stanley's lab by providing artificial sensory input to the rats optically. And I feel that the rest of engineering has been using feedback to enhance control for decades and that it's time for neuroengineering to catch up. So the current stimulation system that thousands and thousands of people have implanted in them to deal with their chronic pain or their Parkinson's disease is like a sledgehammer approach. It's open loop and I believe it's barbaric. 
in the future, it will be something much finer tools and uh, will be a closed loop system. To sort of help you imagine what that might be like, I encourage you to read Michael Korost's book, Worldwide Mind, or this article that he um, published in Wired Magazine in 2009, Powered by Photons, in which he talks about the uh, optical control of neurons and really takes it uh, with his great imagination into where it might lead in terms of human enhancement. So I thank all of you for your attention and I thank my lab for their hard work that made all this possible and our funding agencies uh, that paid for all of this research. And so now I'll go back to um, the other screen sharing off. So uh, are you ready for some questions? Yeah, I'm ready for questions. All right, great. So uh, I have a question from uh, Elizabeth Flores. Um, is this closed loop approach only valid on invasive neural stimulation? Is there a non-invasive neural stimulation technology available today? Yeah, that's a really good question because I didn't mention it at all, but there are lots and lots of people that are experimenting with, and, and this is actually quite inexpensive to do, uh, closed loop systems that are completely non-invasive that use, say, recording of some physiological measurement on the body. Could be an electroencephalogram if you want to get really uh, neural about it, but you could just measure movement, for example. And, um, uh, for example, a closed loop system where you're doing a transcranial um, stimulation, a tr t you know, TDCS, some sort of direct cranial, direct current stimulation of the brain, through the skin is fairly non-invasive that's based on the electroencephalogram recordings of what brain state somebody's in. But you could also use just their galvanic skin response. You know, how much sweat is on your skin is a good signal and very easy to measure and very inexpensive. You could use eye movements with an eye tracker. You could use muscle movements or, or gross movements, balance. There are many different things you could imagine as the control signal for a closed loop system Getting the actuator that somehow influences the brain could be, I mentioned transcranial um, brain stimulation, but it could just be through the sensory system. It could be auditory signals, it could be sounds, it could be something on your skin. And there are um, therapeutic techniques for stimulating, for example, alternately on the left and right hands with vibrations that somehow change the person's uh, mood or changes their ability to process information. So I think the answer is that the field is wide open. We don't really have very good theories for what's gonna work, but the cool thing about closed loop systems is that uh, you constantly tweaking things. And so you can find out uh, where the optima are by just adjusting stuff and, and letting the system proceed and seeing what happens. So from your perspective, so as I understand it right now, uh, most of the work done in the field of, of optical interfacing and, and optogenetics is primarily either with cell cultures or maybe with, you know, small mammals. Um, where, at what point do you think we're going to get to a point perhaps where we're going to see more human studies or, or with larger mammals? What, what do you think is kind of going to be the scaling process like for the next, uh, let's say, 10, 20 years? Do you think we're going to be able to achieve that within that frame? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, already it's been demonstrated in primates for several years now. So, so for sure it's going to work. Uh, the big problem, I suppose, is, is more bureaucratic than it is practical. These uh, vectors that we use to put the genes into the animals are viruses, and most people freak out when they hear somebody saying they want to inject them with a bunch of viruses. Uh, they have been rendered harmless. You know, most of the guts have been taken out of the virus so that they're not going to be pathogenic. But um, in some cases, for example, the lentivirus, they do integrate with the genome and they have the potential then to cause cancer by busting an important gene that controls cell cycle regulation. So you do have to worry about these things whenever you're talking about viruses. This is the broad field of gene therapy. You know, this is not just optogenetics, but all of gene therapy has to worry about these issues. And because there are many uses for gene therapy, it's going to happen. It's guaranteed to happen. Um, and there already have been some human trials with adeno-associated virus and adenovirus. So, 
So I think the gene, gene therapy approaches are going to allow optogenetics to be experimented on in humans soon enough. Uh, my guess is in the next 10 years, that will become commonplace. So, so you don't have to wait very long for that. It's mostly bureaucratic problems and, and not really technical problems. Most of the technical problems have already been solved in animals. Gotcha. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm just waiting for my computer to load here. Uh, well, as I'm waiting for that to pop up, uh, another question that I had uh, was, at what point are you thinking that this technology, so you mentioned that, you know, at the current point, you know, oh, there we go. Actually, so that's one of the questions from chat now that it's uh, showing itself. Uh, so a question from uh, Dylan Mann uh, Krisnik. Uh, what types of models are used for computer simula uh, simulation? Uh, for the simulations in my lab, we had single units. Uh, each had a very simple differential equation that was integrate and made them integrate and fire neuron. Um, you know, if you look at the work of Eugene Izakevich, you can find the equations that we used. Uh, the, they, were, they were very simple. <clears throat> uh, we could run about 20,000 neuron simulation on a single um, CPU computer, you know, that, so in, in real time, we could run it at, at one to one speed. So there, there wasn't anything very tricky about the neurons that we used. Um, they we had maybe a thousand synapses per neuron and we had inhibitory neurons about 10 or 20 percent of inhibitory neurons in the dish so that's how many we put in our um, simulation and we were surprised with, that with so few biologically realistic parameters in our models they emulated many of the physiological properties that our culture dishes showed uh, in fact all of the learning experiments that we did we did first in simulation and prove that they were successful using simulated uh, cultures. And then we got out the living cultures and tried them in those to um, show that the same algorithms work just fine there. Uh, a question from uh, Abiram Singh. Uh, is it possible to read brain behavior under uh, imagined speech based on optical neural interfacing? Um, to read brain behavior. Yeah, I, I imagine so. so. So I didn't talk at all about the recording side of optical neural interfacing. There is such a thing as optical recording, but it's not very well advanced as much as uh, optical stimulation. And however, there are better and better constru constructs being developed that produce an optical signal that is somehow dependent on neural activity. And if you put that construct into part of the brain that controls speech, especially the speech planning part of the brain, then you could conceivably uh, read out what somebody was going to say before they said it. And, um, you know, how successful that would be in terms of whether it would sound understandable depends on really how well we understand how speech is mapped across the different parts of the cortex, which I have to say our understanding is fairly rudimentary. So it probably wouldn't be great, but um, you know, and, and one of the problems with this kind of research is that there aren't too many animals that have complex vocalizations that we could test it out on. So most likely we'd have to wait until we had systems working well in humans that were doing other stuff that we could then try uh, try speech circuits to see if they would work. But it's an interesting question. And one of my friends and colleagues, um, Phil Kennedy, has been spending a lot of time putting electrodes chronically in patients who are locked in, who can't speak at all. And he's trying to get them uh, to be able to speak with synthesizers by um, just thinking about speaking. And he's recording from parts of the motor cortex that controls the speech apparatus. So he's making a little bit of progress with that. And I think if you can do it with wires, then I don't see why you couldn't also do it with optical systems, optogenetic systems. A uh, question from uh, Yannick Hua. Uh, outside of academia, what are some of the companies working in that field uh, job-wise? Uh, you mentioned Neuropace, but if you had any others in mind as well. Um, that is a good question. I am not very well connected with the, with the, private world you know I'm, I'm i was kind of in my 
ivory tower there. Um, there are Medtronics, I know, is very big on implantable devices. You know, they started with heart pacemakers and they've moved on to all these deep brain stimulators. And they recently have developed closed loop systems, for example, that um, measure the tremor signal from a, just an accelerometer that the person is wearing. And they can use that to modulate the deep brain stimulator for somebody with Parkinson's disease. So I don't, I really don't know in terms of companies that are pursuing optogenetics, I couldn't give you any advice on that. I think it's most of that research is going on in academia. Um, so uh, since uh, Neurotech X is uh, primarily focused on, on accessible neurotechnology, and as you are mentioning before that uh, this technology has become uh, the, the cost reduction has been a tenfold decrease in, in certain elements of it. Um, are you seeing a similar trend where uh, this technology may go down the same path as, say, like fo what Focus did for, for TDCS? Or do you think it's always going to remain in a lab environment? Yeah, so it depends what you mean by this technology. There's all different uh, levels of, of things that you could try. And uh, for example, with just $100, you can buy a backyard brains rig and, and record your own brain waves. Um, you could get a little bit more sophisticated and do the um, open BCI, maybe a few hundred dollars. And to do you know, stimulation with DC, TDCS is another 100 bucks or so. So it's, it's getting very accessible to do um, for the for a neurohacker and private um, individuals, well, if we're to focus on uh, optical simulation, yeah, so, yeah. So 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 the question is th probably to do with the constructs. Getting a hold of these tricky um, optogenetic constructs usually requires some kind of institutional review board to approve what you're doing. And otherwise, the people who made the constructs wouldn't release them to you. So to make them yourself is not trivial. You, need, you really do need a genetic engineering lab to build these constructs, uh, which is a lot of centrifuges and, and electrophoresis gels and things like that. So, so that building the constructs is something that probably won't be done by amateurs anytime soon. But if you have compelling experiments to do with them, the best thing to do would be to partner up with a lab that is either already doing optogenetics or has the tools that it takes to do optogenetics and to talk to them and say, hey, I would like to volunteer in your lab and try to do one of these experiments that I had in mind. Uh, they might be open-minded. I know in my lab, we accepted all sorts of people, uh, high school students included, sometimes teachers would come to the lab and spend the summer doing a project that they came up with because we had the tools to do it in our lab. So that's that's in my advice for you know being able to pull off this optogenetics for the lay person in the near future. Sometime in the distant future, maybe 10 or 20 years in the future, uh, it'll be so commonplace that people won't be so freaked out about the idea of putting um, genes into our DNA and, and expressing them and making our cells light sensitive. And then we'll all have to wear foil hats, won't we? Because uh, uh, <laughs> the, light, the light that shines through your skull will be activating your optogenetic constructs all the time. So uh, question, another question from uh, Yannick Hua. Uh, we talked about optical. Uh, is there a future for combined optical and sound? So, uh, and he adds in parenthesis, we've seen some progress with sound-based imaging slash uh, stimulation. Yeah, I think the, the, the right answer is combining all of these things um, that, you know, they all have pluses and minuses, advantages and disadvantages. I was kind of uh, putting down electrodes, but uh, they're simple, you know, and, the, and electronics have been around for a long time. And we know that the brain uses electrical signals to communicate. The, um, the idea of doing neural interfacing with sound is fairly new and, you know, not very well tested. The side effects of that aren't very well known. I think um, on the imaging side, excuse me, it's very exciting, the idea of doing some kind of photoacoustic tomography, for example, where you shine laser beams, pulse laser beams into brain tissue and you can record 
the activity with the sound waves that result. Uh, so I think that there are probably going to be a lot of new things that we're going to be able to do by combining these different techniques. Uh, another one that I heard about that was very interesting was a sort of um, depth coding with sound. If you have certain kind of sound waves, you could do uh, intrinsic signals recording of neural activity, for example, that was um, only at a certain depth in the brain based on the, the ultrasonic um, signal that you're putting in there. I don't know exactly how that works, but uh, it sounds like it would be a solution to the problem that EEG has where you're only recording from the surface of the cortex. Uh, a question, once again, from uh, Dylan Mann uh, Krisnik. Uh, any issue with uh, photo bleaching for optics-based uh, closed-loop neurofeedback? Yes. Um, in some cases where we were clamping the activity at too high a level, we actually had to shine too much light into the cells, and um, they would become no longer able to respond to the light. Now, it's not quite the same as photo bleaching. It might be, I would call it photo inactivation. Uh, if you're working with fluorescent constructs, you often have to worry about photo bleaching where the, where the uh, fluorophore just isn't fluorescent anymore because too much light hit it. So yeah, that is a big issue. That becomes less of an issue if you use uh, longer wavelengths or if you are just very careful in terms of only applying light where you need it and when you need it, uh, just to be, try to be sparing with the amount of light that you supply. You know, a lot of experimenters are, are using way more light than they need to get the effects that they want to get. So the trick is to um, use a closed loop system to modulate that and make sure that you're only giving as much light as you need to do the job. Um. Are there any ethical questions we need to ask ourselves uh, in respect to this technology? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did you have any in mind? Uh, there well, are, there what are some of the open ethics que ethical questions that are, are being discussed right now? Yeah, so, so I already mentioned just the idea of um, implanting new genes into our neurons to make them light sensitive. Uh, a lot of people think that there are ethics involved there. I, I don't particularly. I think that's more of a, a technical technical thing, kind of like taking a, taking a a certain drug or or uh, maybe a immunological agent that changes your immune system. You know, it's going to tweak the system. They're they're all things that are bl fairly blunt instruments. I think that this one, optogenetics, has the potential to be a much finer instrument than drugs that we take on a daily basis. You know, we're, we take a pill for something to affect only us one tiny part of our brain, and yet it's flowing through our entire body, affecting lots of other stuff. So, so I don't think that there's anything intrinsically, um, ethically questionable about optogenetics compared to other things that influence the brain. That said, we are going to be able to have exquisite control of brain tissue. And, and what, however you do that, there are going to be many, many ethical problems with that. You know, we already do have this problem with the drugs that we take, uh, whether they're recreational drugs, medicinal drugs, whatever. Uh, there's a lot of ethical issues with drugs. And there's some ethical issues with um, brain stimulators. You know, if, for example, somebody with DBS notices a side effect that when they have their um, DBS turned on to help their chronic pain, it also makes them smarter. Are they somehow cheating on a test if they turn it on extra, you know, turn it up to 11 just before the test? Um, so, so anything that might enhance our functionality has those questions of, well, who gets to have this and who doesn't? Uh, when, you know, at what age should people have these things? And should it be only for medical purposes or should it be perhaps also to enhance us, not just fix us up to make us normal again, but make us even better than normal? So there are a lot of, there are many, many ethical questions here, but I would argue that most of them are not specific to optogenetics in any way. They're just to do with tweaking the brain, which we can now do with sensory input, we can do with brain stimulators, we can do with drugs, we can already do it with a lot of different ways, and we need to be thinking about these for all of those. 
for those that are interested in potentially creating their own neuroengineering lab or our lab focused on optical interfacing, uh, optogenetics, um, say, what would you suggest to people that perhaps are in this webinar right now from different academic, academic institutions and, and actually getting started in this process? You mentioned that there are more open source tools that are available, but I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more beyond that. Yeah, so are, are you asking about people who are already in academia? Yeah, so say you have an academic group that's interested in going more into this field, because I'm I'm assuming that since this is a field that's only maybe about 10 years old or so, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for growth and for more expansion worldwide. So what would be your suggestions in order to move forward with that? Yeah, well, the first step with any decision about uh, where your lab ought to go is is read a lot of papers. You know, I, I, a good friend of mine once said that you can save, uh, you can, uh, save an afternoon in the library by doing six months of research. <laughs> you know? So, so um, read papers about optogenetics and find out what others are doing. And then I would suggest to visit one of those labs, maybe even do an internship there or spend some time sabbatical there uh, and learn, learn the techniques hands-on by somebody else who's already doing them. That will save you a lot of time. Trying to figure out how to do it yourself by reading papers is gonna be difficult. But reading papers is the first step. Talking to people who are doing it is the next step. Uh, going in their labs and actually seeing them do it is the next step. Uh, then actually doing it yourself with them is the next step. And eventually, obviously, you're going to have to write grants to get the money to do it because everything in biomedical research costs a lot of money. And um, so it doesn't hurt to start early planning your grants and and flying it past people who are already good at getting grants and making sure that um, they think that it's going to be funded. Uh, what would you say are some of the hard open questions right now in the field? Uh, in which field? You have to say uh, there's a lot of fields I touched on there. Um, so if we focus on optogenetics, uh, okay, let's see. <clears throat> I think that the promoters was a big issue uh, when we, the, the last time that we uh, got constructs, which was maybe about five years ago, and I'm sure this problem hasn't been solved. People were very busy at work coming up with different kinds of promoters to stick on the optogenetic constructs to make them expressed in certain cell types, or maybe, maybe they get expressed only under certain conditions. And working on those promoters is a, is a huge, big job. It's not easy to do. It's hard to get them to work in the cells that you want. And, um, and then there's the issue of packaging. You know, sometimes you, you found a great promoter, but it's too big. It has too many base pairs to squeeze it into the virus or to squeeze it into the uh, adeno-associated viral vector. And then you have, kind of have to go back to the drawing board. So, so getting the right promoters is a big, big, big open question. The other one I sort of alluded to a little bit earlier is other uh, things. So, so we have now pretty good control of activity with stimulators and inhibitors. We don't have very good recording systems. And also getting a recording system that works optically at the very same time as stimulators working optically is a little bit tricky. It's not impossible, but it means that the light um, wavelengths probably have to not overlap. In other words, if you're, if you're stimulating with blue light, you're probably not gonna wanna be recording blue light because then your stimulation is causing an artifact. So you probably be recording with some other wavelengths of light and you have constructs that their preferred wavelengths don't overlap too much or that you have some good optics to filter out the um, one signal from another. Then there are issues of uh, sort of biocompatibility, of getting the fiber optics into tissue, getting a power supply and a light source under the skin somewhere probably, uh, where it could be recharged and you know making that so it's not too doesn't heat up too much and doesn't cause infections. Those are kind of the same problems that go along with any biomedical device that's implanted into a person. So these a lot of these problems are already being solved for other reasons, but they're still not very well solved. You know the kinds of uh, the device that works for Parkinson's stimulation is mostly sitting under the clavicle here because it's really too big to stick on somebody's head. So, um, 
So there are a lot of packaging issues. And, and then uh, the other one is software. You know, a lot of the closed loop stuff that I talked about required us to make our own software. And if you, um, if you wanted to get into this, I, I strongly urge you to, to contact those guys at Open eFizz because they are really pushing this software thing forward to make closed loop systems cheaper and more effective and faster and more channels and, and all those things. They're, they're really trying to improve them as much as they can for, for real world applications. Fantastic. And so we'll just have a couple of extra questions before we uh, sign off here. Uh, for people that are interested in getting more into the field or learning a little bit more about it, you already provided a few uh, resources that they can find uh, also on your, and one of them being uh, the resources on your website. But do you have any other suggestions that you can uh, provide? Uh, well, definitely check out the websites of Ed Boyden and Carl Dyseroth. You know, those guys, as I mentioned, are, are really pioneers in opto optogenetics. Um, you know, and, and a lot of other things as well. Uh, has a medical um, bent to his research. He is a doctor. He's an actual doctor who does, who sees real patients. So he's very keen on getting this stuff into cl the clinic. And if you have, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you should definitely talk to him or people in his lab. Uh, whereas Ed Boyden is very uh, much more interested in the basic science of it and the sort of future, more futuristic applications. He's at MIT and um, his lab is doing a wide variety of different things, not just optogenetics, but, but many, many different um, things that are taking neuroengineering to the next level. So, so, you know, of course, there are many other labs that are really pushing this stuff, but I think those two guys, if you, if you, if you have any interest at all in optogenetics, you, you should probably go to them first. And uh, we have one final question in chat here. Uh, uh, there are, so this is from uh, Elizabeth Flores. Uh, Lara's, uh, sorry, there are theories that that fend that autism is a disease based on electrical unbalances in the brain. Have you ever worked with neural stimulation of quote unquote autistic brains to test out this theory? Um, yeah, so we haven't. No, I have never worked uh, in the autism field. In fact, as I mentioned, most of our work was in vitro. We did a few things with rats, but really not anything in humans. And as far as I know, there isn't really any good animal model for autism. Um, but, you know, to say that it's somehow an electrical imbalance in the brain is, is almost guaranteed to be true. Pretty much any disability that has neural complications is some kind of electrical problem since brains, since the language that they speak uh, is partly electric, you know, it's partly chemical as well. I think um, one thing that is almost certainly true is that autism has a, a developmental dimension to it. It's something that seems to happen at a certain developmental age, you know, around age two or three, and um, seems to alter the wiring of the brain permanently, or at least on a long-term basis. And for that reason, I think that the solutions are going to have to be developmental. In other words, they have to be early interventions uh, that will notice and deal with the, uh, whatever it is that's going wrong quickly before the wiring gets too messed up. Now, I should also mention that autism is a spectrum disorder, and there are, you know, not too harmful forms of it, like Asperger's, um, that people with that wouldn't even consider a disease or a problem, in which case you could say you might want to figure out what's good about it and try to do more of that, you know. So, so, so the, the take home there is learn more about how the brain develops, both in utero and in early life, and um, try to figure out what kinds of systems would tweak that development. They, they could be, you know, I, I could easily imagine that in the future, these optogenetic systems could be one of the solutions to that problem. Fantastic. And uh, one final question before I sign off here. If people are interested in uh, getting in contact with you, what's the best way of doing so? If they have any further questions they want to ask. Um, let's see. Well, I think that the best thing to do is first go and look at our website, uh, which I think you have a link for, but it's potterlab.gattech.edu. And 
There's a publications page that has all of our papers free for downloading. So you can try answering your questions by reading our papers. And if you've done that and you still have questions, I'm happy to answer them uh, if you send me an email. And you could probably find my email on my web page if you're clever. So, um, so just uh, do that. I'm happy to answer questions. And, you know, if you want to, I'm also working as a paid consultant for uh, companies that are, you know, say trying to integrate artificial intelligence that somehow is more biological. And if you are one of those kind of people, then you have a separate uh, web page that's all about my consulting that's sitting over there on my Potter Lab website. So have a look at that. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Potter, for uh, joining us for this webinar. And uh, thank you to those in chat uh, who stayed with us. Uh, our next webinar will probably be in about two weeks or so. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. Check uh, check out our, I think it'll be on the, the next newsletter with a little bit more details about that. Uh, but once again, thank you, Professor Potter. And uh, we'll see you all at the next uh, webinar. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sydney. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.